on the orders of Caesar, Roman cavalry close in around an escaped Gallic chieftain. Up until now, this man had been held by Caesar as a hostage. But really, his situation was no different than from the rest of his country. By this point, Gaul had been occupied by Rome for years, but our chieftain knew something. That men, all men, are free. So he attempted to escape. But now, it's over. He was caught. The Romans approach, ready to kill our heroic chieftain. But before they reach him, the Gaul declares, I am a free man, living in a free country. After that, his life was stolen from him by the Roman state. There are many theories of history out there. Marxist, Hegelian, and Great Man all come to mind. But what about a theory which puts the individual at its center? And no, that's not what Great Man theory is. Great Man history sees the majority of humans as basically meaningless, or at best, incidental supporters of the actually important men who drive history. What I'm talking about is a theory of history that sees the full value of the individual and what he can accomplish in a true state of freedom. That's what I'm going to present to you today. So you can call me Ezekiel. This is the Libertarian Theory of History. Let's jump in! Along with Ayn Rand, Rose Wilder Lane and Isabel Patterson are the three mothers of the American Libertarian movement. Which at least partly makes up for the fact that none of them had any real children of their own. Anyway, a successful Libertarian movement would require a Libertarian Theory of History to justify itself. And that work fell to Rose Wilder Lane and Isabel Patterson. Partly together, and partly on their own, they crafted this theory and publish their insights in their books, Discovery of Freedom and The God of the Machine. So now that we understand our sources, let's get into the theory itself. Man is born free, and he dies free. It's what happens in between that we need to worry about, and that's what makes up history. So man is unique among living creatures, because there are no natural environments in which he can survive. Every other animal has the innate ability to survive in at least one location on Earth. So if the whole world is trying to kill us, how do humans survive at all? Well, while we may not be particularly fast, strong, or even able to fly, we do have one advantage. Reason. With our reason, plus a few other adaptations, humans can live just about anywhere. This fact is central to the libertarian theory of history, because it takes this power of human creativity and abstracts it into a concept called energy. So long as men are free to create, the energy is free to flow, and as long as productive energy is freely flowing, men will survive, and eventually thrive. But there's a problem. Productive enterprise is not the only outlet for human energy. The other is violence. So instead of creating their own means of survival, some men will choose to take it from others. Functionally speaking, this is man, a creative creature, choosing to live as a parasite. Because of these men, productive energy will cease to flow. This will result in the death of every man, productive and parasitic alike. So this is where government steps in. To solve this prisoner's dilemma, governments are given the power to keep violent men away from the energy circuit. But, in order to function, the government will need to siphon off a small amount of energy for itself. To most, this will seem like a no-brainer. But, while such a government can ward off violent men, it doesn't actually get rid of them. So what's to stop them from just moving into the government? Well, nothing. And according to this theory, that's one of the main drivers of history. Over time, once good governments will start to siphon more and more energy from the circuit, until eventually, they destroy their country. But why would a parasite kill its own host? Shouldn't it intentionally leave enough energy in the circuit so that it can maintain itself into the future? Well, it's good that you'd ask that question, because it's a sign that you're a productive man. But that's not how a parasite thinks. Unproductive men have no idea where energy comes from, or how to get more of it. They only know that it's there, and that they want it. But some of you might be asking how a government can get taken over by the unproductive in the first place. After all, they'd require the consent of their victims to perform their theft. Well, that's not a problem, because they found a trick that works since the dawn of time. Altruism. Instead of saying that you're taking the energy for yourself, just say that's for a less fortunate third party. After all, only a monster would say no to that. By the way, if the libertarian theory of history is true, unproductive men have been using this trick for a long time. So long, in fact, that they've actually come to believe that they're more moral than the producers they're stealing from. After all, a productive man is obsessed with his own egoistic material gain. 
Meanwhile, an altruist lives for the far higher spiritual cause of distributing that material to the less fortunate, while skimming a little bit off the top for themselves, of course. Now, this theory of history turns two common archetypes on their heads. In nearly every other worldview, strong and powerful leaders are heroes, while smugglers, who defy the rule of those leaders, are villains. In the libertarian theory of history, it's the exact opposite. Remember, all that a strong leader does is siphon energy out of the circuit for his own needs. Meanwhile, smugglers directly fight that process by creating alternate routes through which energy can flow, reconnecting the circuit. In fact, much of the success of the First British Empire can be attributed to the weakness of many of its kings. For most of the early empire, the kings of England were either incompetent or were strong, but inherited a weak position from an incompetent, which kept them too distracted to actually rule. So with neither kings nor bureaucrats to stop them, the English people were left free to go off on independent ventures. Many such ventures were to create colonies in the New World, and eventually, to conquer India. Tasks which were, in many cases, performed by private companies. It was only when England got a strong king who inherited a strong position that the First Empire fell apart. When not busy with his insanity, George III did everything he could to control and regulate his realm. This is exactly what upset the Thirteen Colonies so much that they decided to go their own way, destroying the First Empire. But what about times when a strong leader is needed, especially during wartime? Well, the libertarian theory of history would agree that a strong leader is needed, but there are two key caveats. The first is that this leader should never take more from the energy circuit than he absolutely requires. Throughout history, many leaders have used war as an excuse to take control of industries, often claiming that they'll make them more productive, thus helping the war effort. But most of the time, they actually make them less productive. Remember, strong leaders don't produce anything, so taking an industry out of the hands of the productive and into the hands of the unproductive is a recipe for disaster. The second caveat is that once the crisis is passed, the strong leader must give up his power. So this requires a truly special kind of man, one who's both experienced with and able to expertly wield power, while also being completely willing to give it up. As far as I can tell, there are really only two good ways to find this kind of person. The first is to strike lucky and get a leader like George Washington. But I think the ancient Romans had a much more reliable solution. Dictatorship. And I swear, it's not what it sounds like. Well, not exactly what it sounds like. In ancient Rome, a dictator did not come to power through a violent revolution. Rather, the dictatorship was a constitutional position occupied by a single man for either six months or until the resolution of the crisis. As a dictator, a man had absolute control, and was expected to use it to save the republic. Until the decline of that republic, Roman dictators always served honorably and gave up power when the time came. By creating a system that could both rapidly consolidate and remove power, the Romans were able to survive existential crises for hundreds of years without losing their freedom. By the way, if England gave us a good example of a successful energy circuit, then Rome provides us with a great example of what it looks like when an energy circuit fails. The siphoning started slowly, and with altruistic causes like the grain dole. After all, what kind of monster would oppose free food to the poor? But as Rome's control over its economy became stronger, once productive countryside farmers started to get forced into the cities, adding even more unproductive men to the grain dole. But who'd have to make that extra food? Why, the remaining overtaxed farmers, of course. Naturally, this created a vicious cycle. Government tampering with the Roman energy circuit would soon come to its horrifying conclusion when the Romans, in an effort to assert yet more control over their economy, basically invented serfdom. It's at around that point when the circuit was operating at a loss, and Rome became completely and totally doomed. So according to this theory, it was not barbarians with swords and axes that destroyed Rome. It was bureaucrats with their pens and papers hundreds of years before. The barbarians were just looting the remains. So before I go, I'd like to leave you with an anecdote which I think perfectly encapsulates this theory of history. In 17th century France, under the leadership of Louis XIV, France was establishing itself as the strongest and most prestigious nation in Europe. But the wars and palaces necessary to achieve that cost a lot of money, and the French state was quickly running out. To resolve this issue, an economic advisor named Colbert was appointed by the government. He wanted to stimulate the economy, and hopefully raise tax revenue in the process. He sought to do this through an increasing onslaught of rules and regulations, which for some reason not only failed to stimulate economic growth, but even seemed to be slowing it down. This made no sense to Colbert. After all, his goal was to help the economy, so his interventions had to be helping at least a little, right? So to investigate what was going on, Colbert summoned a group of businessmen to ask what the French state could do to stimulate the economy. Without missing a beat, a proud Frenchman stood up and answered, Laissez-nous faire. Leave us alone. Like his Gallic ancestor long before him, our proud businessman knew something Colbert didn't. That men are born free, die free, and for all their lives, they should remain free.